My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS. And, uh, okay, can we all get started? Thank you very much, everybody. We're delighted that you're here. Welcome. We're uh, very pleased to welcome you here. I, I must say I'm uh, very grateful. Friday, Fridays are usually not strong turnout days, you know, at think tanks. And it, it reflects your interest in what I think is going to be a very important conversation. And uh, very honored that, uh, that Minister uh, Mitaraki is with us today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank We're you. really pleased. Um, you know, there's, I, I'm really glad you're here because uh, there's a standard motif in Washington policy circles, which is, it's so hopeless, don't even bother thinking about, about Greece. And there's nothing further from the truth when you think about it. If you walk around Washington, look at official Washington, just survey the landscape, you will find nothing other than a classic Greek motif in this town. It is... It is how we think of ourselves. We think of ourselves as being uh, part of the embodiment of this, uh, this popular impulse, of popular rule and democracy that was born in Greece. And it's just so profound in us that we don't spend enough time thinking about it. And we don't spend enough time thinking about uh, a, an ally that has been going through very hard times. Now, I would. I'd say if, if it were not hard enough to deal with the economic problems, Greece, of course, sits in a complicated neighborhood. You know, we have all of the turmoil in, uh, in Syria. We have all of the turmoil in Turkey. Uh, all of this chaos that's on the doorstep of this ally of ours and is carrying extra heavy loads by itself. And so it's important for us in the Washington policy community to focus a bit. I always say to our dignitaries that visit how grateful I am that you come because this complicated, sophisticated America, we only can think about one issue at a time. You know, and we get preoccupied with whatever that issue is of the day. And if you don't come to open our aperture, cause us to think more broadly about the world, we're just not going to be spending the time and energy to focus as we should. And so this is a, really a gift to us. Minister, that you would spend this time with us. Help us think through uh, a region that we frankly cannot uh, have fail. And we need to have your success and your energy and your imagination be part of that success. We were very fortunate this summer to have Prime Minister Samaras with us. And it was frankly very inspirational. This is a guy who is the right man at this time to help with some very challenging issues. He has enormous credibility here in Washington. And I think you're going to build on that today, Minister. So I thank you for coming. I thank all of you for coming. Heather, why don't I ask you to get started so that with a real introduction, but to say welcome to everybody. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hamry, thank you so much. And colleagues, uh, thank you for joining us. For many of you, this may be your first visit to our brand new building at CSIS, and we are delighted to welcome you. And I learned something about the minister this morning. This is your first visit to Washington. Yep. So new building, first visit, we could not be uh, more excited. Uh, what we'd like to do, I'm going to briefly introduce the minister. Um, the minister, you can choose to sit here or use the podium, whatever you feel mm -hmm. most comfortable. Provide some framing remarks, and then we're going to engage in a bit of a dialogue here. I have lots of questions, and then I promise we will turn to you and engage you uh, in a very important and lively discussion. We are so grateful for this series, which is designed to highlight the Greek presidency, the EU uh, rotating council presidency. And our partners and the generosity of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation has allowed us to, to put on this important series of discussions highlighting this agenda. So we are extremely grateful. And of course, our thanks and partnership to uh, the ambassador and to the embassy for, for your partnership as well. In some ways, uh, Minister Metaraki, your title speaks volumes to me, Deputy Minister of Development and Competitiveness. 
Europe is having a competitiveness challenge. Uh, and I think your title, and as you were named uh, last uh, summer, July of 2012, um, really uh, offers us some insight into how Greece is overcoming many of the structural uh, economic challenges it faces. Um, you, have, uh, you have been in the private sector. You have experienced the financial community from many different levels. And now you're bringing those talents uh, here. We were reflecting, the minister, uh, you look so fresh, no, no jet lag from Bali, where uh, you were in trade discussions there as well. Um, and uh, we, we are delighted uh, for you to help us understand the Greek agenda uh, for the EU rotating presidency, your own sense of uh, the future opportunities and challenges that 2014 will bring. To the, to the Greek government. Uh, and then again, uh, when you're done with your remarks, I have a long list of questions, so I'm looking forward to engaging with you. So without further, do, uh, further ado, thank you so much, colleagues, for joining us. And Minister Mitraki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Heather, thank you so much for your very kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies to discuss uh, the upcoming Greek presidency of the Council of the European Union and at the same time take the opportunity to take stock of developments in Greece, present the situation, the opportunities and the challenges we're facing. Um, the remarks of your president were very right. It takes some time for the market, for the analysts, for the community to appreciate the changes that are happening to countries or companies when we talk about the financial sector how are the right policy choices reflected in outcomes. And one of the role we have is to communicate the message clearly around the world, and especially in Washington, of what policy, changes, uh, policy choices we made in Greece in the last couple of years, and how are those playing out. I promise, because I like uh, interactive uh, discussions, to keep my opening remarks short. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about sort of four key topics. I'm sure the audience and yourself may introduce others. The first is the upcoming presidency of the Council of the European Union. Greece will be taking on on January 1st for six months. We're taking over the presidency at a time where EU is also in transition, and 2014 will be an unusual year. In the first half of the year, the European Parliament will have elections, and a new one will be elected. On the second half of the year, the Commission, the European Commission, will change, where the countries will nominate new Commission members. Therefore, two out of the three institutions of the European Union, the Commission and the Parliament, will be in transition in 2014. That puts an extra requirement in Council to be more stable and allow the EU to continue functioning on the key priorities we have. We're going to have four priorities as uh, Greek priorities during the period. The first priority would be growth, jobs, and cohesion. EU went through a very tough economic crisis. We were affected, like all countries in the world, by the global economic slowdown from 2008. And countries that had already issues with high levels of debt were affected the most. We have taken the economic political choices to recover our economies, and most of the European economies are now recovering. And we expect Eurozone next year to, be, to have a positive GDP growth. Same goes for Greece. However, the social consequences of this transition have been great. Countries like Greece have went to a 27% level of total unemployment. It peaked around 60% of unemployment for the, for the young people. And one of the key priorities would be to reinvest in the economy of Europe uh, in order to create growth which is not jobless. So this is priority number one. Priority number two is further integration of Eurozone, which has to do with the banking union, has to do with reinforced budgetary and economic integration frameworks. The third priority for Greece will be migration, borders, and mobility. We have had a challenging neighborhood, to, and we've seen a lot of inflows of illegal migration into Europe. Migration into Europe has seen as a national issue until recently, Greece will place in the European agenda as one of our four priorities the need for an integrated European policy uh, within EU, but also with the relationship we have with the countries neighboring Greece, to create the economic condition in these countries to reduce the trend of 
illegal migration, but at the same time better protect European borders. The fourth priority for Greece will be an integrated horizontal thematic approach on maritime affairs. Uh, that not simply has to do with maritime policy. Uh, we're going further than the Limassol Declaration. We're also talking about, for example, through ec exclusive economic zones, exploiting natural resources that Europe has, and these are important for the recovery of Eurozone. So these are the four key priorities of Greece as rotating president of the Council of the European Union. I will be personally be chairing the Foreign Affairs Council on trade. And uh, trade liberalization it will be a key driver for growth and jobs in Europe. You mentioned the competitiveness gap. I think the whole Western world is facing very critical challenges, and I'm sure that will be taken on on the Q&A. But how do we translate the four key pillars of the EU, the Greek policy in the EU, on specific trade issues? One priority for us will be uh, furthering the, trans, uh, the TTIP agreement, the agreement between the US and the EU about the liberalization of trade, uh, about market access, non-trade barriers, intellectual property protection, issues that are very dear both to the EU and to the US. We anticipate that this agreement can create in total more than 200 billion of economic growth for both the EU and for uh, the US. So this will be the key priority for the Foreign Affairs Council uh, for the first six months of 2014. At the same time, we have had a breakthrough in the World Trade Organization in Indonesia uh, the week before, where the trade facilitation agreement did uh, get approved by all of the WTO countries. That has been a remarkable improvement in the multilateral level of trade negotiations. So we need to see now how we will further the discussion within WTO, and that will be a second key priority for us in Council. Uh, finally, just to close the chapter on the, on the Trade Council, um, we, will f we will prioritize the agreements that uh, are maturing, and the agreement with Singapore and Canada are in the top of the list. But also, we will accelerate discussion with countries in the Mediterranean and the Gulf, and that ties well not only with the number one priority, which is jobs and, uh, and growth, but also with the migration, third priority, and the fourth, the maritime priority. So that's the key things on our EU agenda. Uh, briefly about Greece, we have had six consecutive years of recession. Uh, there is almost no precedent in global economic history of a country having to undergo six consecutive years in recession. Um, thanks to the sacrifice of the Greek people, uh, which have been enormous, uh, Greece is st standing again on its feet. Samaras was elected as prime minister in 2012. Our first priority was to recover our credibility and ensure that Greece remains a full member of the Eurozone. We believe we achieved this target in 2012, as there has been no discussion in any political a forum in 2013 challenging Greece membership of the EU, uh, of the Eurozone. The second uh, objective for 2013 was to beat our budget expectation and stand again on our feet. We've seen in the second half of uh, 2013 our recession estimate to be uh, revised to the better, and that's the first time we're revising to the better recession estimates during the crisis, and we expect the year to close at 4% versus 45 and we see growth coming in 2014. We met our budget objective. Greece was expecting a flat uh, primary surplus 2013. We will actually have 850 million euros of primary surplus, so we're beating our estimates in the budget. And these are positive news. Now, the challenge in 2014, and believe me, we have a lot of challenges still ahead of us, is to get the economy back on track, and we see the unemployment starting to come down from 27%. Uh, we were flat month on month, we had good inflows of uh, employment in the private sector in 2013. We hope to see these trends recovering. So that's my third pillar. The fourth pillar which I would like to highlight is that Greece is open for business. Um, invest, we believe that the investments are the key way of driving the econo economic growth. We have a very pro-market approach. Uh, we've seen 2013 a record number of uh, new investments uh, coming in the country in the order book, as I call them, to be executed in the years to come. The biggest of those being the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, uh, which is a key um,
will be a key contributor to growth creation in Greece, but also a key contributor to energy safety for Europe. And this is something which we will support. And uh, so we've seen positive inflow of investments in 2013 in the level of around 7 billion euros. We have changed a lot of uh, bureaucratic uh, obstacles that the Greek economy had. And now, according to the OECD, Greece has been top among its members in taking structural reforms which are pro-growth in the last period. Greece has moved up 28 places in the World Bank doing business report in just two years. So there's a lot of good work happening. We've seen early investors recognizing that. The spreads of Greece moved from 27 percentage points to 6 percentage points. They're now at pre-crisis level. So the market is already recognizing that Greece has gone through the toughest part of the transition and they're willing to invest in Greek debt at, at pre-crisis level. So these are the four key topics where I would hope we discussed and any other topics that yourself or the audience would like to add. I hope I haven't spoke more than my allocation of time. I wish other speakers were so concise and so high impact. Thank you, Minister, so much. That was a terrific um, overview. Uh, and and I, I think, again, the common thread from Dr. Hamry's comments to your own, um, we need to put ourselves in a different frame of mind, understanding, I think, and I, I personally can't understand six years of recession and 27 percent unemployment, over 50 percent youth unemployment. I can only imagine what those conditions would be like in my own country and, and the civil unrest and the strife that could be there, and it, it is uh, certainly uh, a enormous feat to overcome that and to start seeing some very promising and early shoots of, of growth. So we, again, thank you for reminding us of that. I, as I was uh, reflecting uh, this morning and reading my headlines over my cup of coffee, I, I, I was thinking uh, uh, of, of uh, former British Prime Minister Harold uh, Macmillan's great quote when, when someone asked him, well, what can knock you off this perfect agenda that you've outlined? And he said, of course, events, dear boy, events. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes, uh, any well-planned um, rotating presidency agenda can be suddenly thrust by events. And we're certainly seeing historic events happen in Maidan Square uh, in Kyiv. And this is not a priority for your presidency. It's uh, uh, an issue for the Lithuanian presidency. Uh, but as we're watching this historic, uh, potentially historic uh, sweep in, in, in Kyiv, I'm wondering if you could uh, reflect uh, what, if any, uh, opportunities the, uh, the Greek government, this crisis, may continue into your presidency. Uh, some, some thoughts uh, on that. And the other event that we know about, as you alluded to, is the May 25th European Parliament elections, where we may see Europe elect the most Eurosceptic, anti-Europe parliament that we've ever seen. And certainly there are ramifications for Greek, uh, for, uh, Greek politics nationally for that election. And I'd love your reflections on that. I have a couple of other questions, but I think I'm going to give you them in Good. small spoonfuls so I don't overwhelm you. Thank you. I think, Heather, you raised two very important points. First of all, on Ukraine, Eastern Partnership is a priority for the European Union. And at the Foreign Affairs uh, Trade Council, we've taken uh, a resolution before the events, of course, the recent events, that we strongly support the agreement. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, there was a political benchmark set by the EU, which we hope that uh, Ukraine, in their path to <coughs> democracy, will adhere to. Um, naturally, we think that the, the situation will continue during the Greek presidency, will take stock, but uh, it is an objective of the European Union to enlarge its trade and uh, political and economic relationship to our friends to the East. And we hope we'll see positive resolution uh, also for the good of Europe, but also for the good of Ukraine and the other countries. On the issue of elections, um, I think one of the key topics, uh, discipline for PhD students in the next 10 years would be how Europe handled the crisis, how, the, how Western economies are handling the um, the economic crisis and what are the political consequences to our democratic values from the sudden uh, pressure that European societies faced. Uh, it is possible that at the European Parliament you'll have voices which are not uh, European mainstream voices like uh, in previous Parliament. I think that's a challenge for policymakers in Europe to ensure that we maintain economic discipline but at the same time we foster growth and we foster uh, the and build on the democratic values that unite us all. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me turn uh, a bit to um, the, the maritime strategy or the maritime issues that you've highlighted in the uh, agenda presence, uh, presidency. I was reading some remarks by um, Prime Minister Samaras in Vilnius mm -hmm. when he mentioned with very specific interest about undersea energy exploration, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the uh, exclusive economic zone, which of course brings us to issues related to reconciliation uh, of Cyprus. A Turkish foreign minister, I believe, is visiting Athens, uh, or has visited Athens. Can you give me a sense of uh, Athens' approach to potentially seeking a, a new start uh, on uh, reuniting those talks on, on Cyprus and how potential um, unconventional gas could be a part of that conversation? Uh, first of all, on the issue of Cyprus, Greece is supporting the efforts of uh, President Anastasiadis in uh, Cyprus to reignite talks about the Cypriot issues, and we expect uh, and we hope to see progress on that. On the issue of natural resources, uh, Cyprus is already moving ahead uh, with exploitation of natural resources found within their um, national waters, and this is important for the Cypriot economy, but for the European Union in general. Energy security is a key issue that Europe has to tackle. It's not only an economic issue, that sort of there is value underwater in areas in Mediterranean where the relevant countries have their uh, respective rights. It is important from a security point of view that Europe becomes more, um, um, finds its own sources and doesn't rely exclusively on imports as we do now, especially for natural gas. One of the issues, when you mentioned about the competitive challenge in Europe, uh, energy costs probably is in the top of the agenda. Mm -hmm. And we had the opportunity many times to discuss with our other uh, colleagues, uh, other economic ministers, what is the key concern we have about competitiveness, and it is energy. So exploiting the resources we have in the Mediterranean, it is a priority for a number of reasons. Uh, there has been a lot of progress in international law in how you delineate um, exclusive economic zones. This is a topic that we're raising at a European level. Uh, and as I th we think at the European level, we need to find the right answers. Fantastic. Let me turn to TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Next week, there'll be a third round of negotiations mm -hmm. here in Washington. How much, uh, we've been obviously watching the, after the impact, the effect of the NSA revelations on data protection and privacy. Give me your reflections and certainly uh, your sense uh, of your colleagues in Europe. How big of an issue will data protection play into the TTIP negotiations as they advance? I think data protection is a critical issue for, uh, for all of us, and uh, I think uh, TTIP could also be an opportunity for, to improve the framework uh, in both sides of the, of the Atlantic. Uh, we think TTIP uh, can be a key booster for economic growth, uh, both in the US and EU, so it is a priority now for all my colleagues in the Trade Council, and as I understand, it's becoming a priority also in Washington, and we hope that we'll see uh, both sides of the Atlantic pushing through their own regulatory side of the, that needs to be, take place for the agreement to, to work. At Council, we gave, gave the Commission the necessary uh, mandate to negotiate, and I'm very pleased to see that the third round is already taking place. If you see the comments made by the chief negotiators in the first two, two rounds, there is progress in many chapters and the working uh, flat hours, so not only meeting uh, once every many weeks, but also with video conferences and conference calls all the time are progressing different agendas. So there is some optimism that this agreement could proceed uh, at, uh, at a good time frame. The fact that the EU has completed the agreement with Canada could help accelerate certain issues. Uh, of course, there will be some difficult topics of discussion. We are trying to reconcile different way of thinking in, in key issues, but I think the benefits for both the economies are more than the cost of having to make a compromise. Trade agreements are always about compromise, and in the end, no one is absolutely happy except the hundreds of thousands of people that find a job thanks to the growth created by this agreement. Thank you. One final question, I promise I'm going to bring you into our conversation. I'd like to turn to Greece now. Mm -hmm. So on Sunday, um, Ireland exits uh, its um, program. 
Yet we know in the spring comes a, perhaps a more difficult conversation about additional or supplemental funding that will be needed to, to provide Greece to, to bridge a gap. Um, I welcome your, your thoughts on that, the, the difficulties of, of that politically within uh, Greece. And certainly I think the government has been very reluctant, if not pushing back, to say society cannot take any more of, of, of austerity. We must have a different approach. So I would welcome your thoughts as we look towards 2014 and the renegotiation, uh, the extension of, of potential refinancing for a new package. First of all, I have to say I'm very, very pleased that Ireland will be exiting the program. They have had to go through tough choices. Uh, I need to highlight, however, that the Greek program was considerably steeper and the level of consolidation required and achieved was much more demanding in the case of Greece. And therefore, the consequences, the social consequences for the Greek program was, uh, was much tougher. As the IMF has said, uh, the, multipliers, uh, the, the multiplier of the fiscal consolidation program into the GDP was, was much uh, bigger than originally anticipated, and therefore, to put it bluntly, we got it wrong with regard to the social consequences and the cost of the social consequences back to the fiscal. You know, there's a cycle that when the economy is contracting faster than anticipated, that affects automatically revenues. And uh, so Greece has had to go through a tougher period. Now, looking forward in 2014, first of all, we are clearly in a primary surplus uh, area, territory. And therefore, Greece no longer needs funding to cover our own needs. The only reason we need funding is to, for payment of capital and payment of interest. And that's, I think, a very fundamental difference versus years before, where people were feeling that sort of they were lending to Greece to pay its current obligations. We are covering our current obligations ourselves. And actually, in 2013, I just don't give you more, uh, many numbers, but just give you ideas, we met our revenue objective as a government. We actually we, we done better than expected in tax collection versus the budget. So now we have the fundamentals for this primary surplus to be sustainable in 2014. Greece will actually be below the 3% threshold of total deficit in 2014, uh, and that's a very positive thing. Also, the fact that spreads have gone down to 6% means that Greece has access to the markets again. Maybe not today, but hopefully in 2014. That creates a completely different mix. So, for example, if there is a, there is a small funding gap, and just to clarify what funding gap means in this case is we need to roll over debt. We don't need funding to cover needs. We feel that Greece has options that did not have a year ago. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, let's turn, uh, turn this conversation over to you. If you could just raise your hand and uh, we have microphones. Uh, if you could give us your name and affiliation. And as we like to say, we like to keep our comments short and our questions provocative. So uh, with those guidelines, I think we have a question right up here in the front. We'll just wait for the microphone. Hi, and welcome to Washington. My name is Yulia Volkovska. I work for uh, Voice of America and Macedonian Service here in DC. Uh, I would uh, like to ask you regarding the uh, ongoing name dispute between Macedonia and Greece. Of course, it's related to uh, economic uh, developments as well. I would uh, uh, like to point out uh, uh, the statement of uh, Mr. Um, Venizelos, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, recently in Brussels. Uh, so I'm going to use that and I'm going to ask uh, your opinion on that and your opinion, opinion of, the, of the problem. Uh, he said that the, the name issue is not bilateral a matter between those two countries, uh, but a pending international problem. And uh, so would this problem be considered as a priority during Greece's upcoming presidency? That's one. And of course, I would appreciate your comment on the, on the issue at this point. Thanks. I think there is, there is an issue that uh, needs to be resolved. And hopefully, we'll see um, policy choices that are less, um, that are more accommodating from our neighbors, then that will allow this international issue to be resolved. Very good. Ma'am, right here. So 
Thank you. Julia Panuria Cloni is economist focusing on development and issues. My question has to do with climate change. Given the negative, progressively negative effects of climate change and the recognition of the human factor, that means our consumption and production pattern is a contributing factor. Do you anticipate that to be an item in the agenda of the Greek presidency in the EU that means to uh, encourage more global cooperation in facing that danger? Thank you. I think climate change is a challenge that uh, everyone around the world recognizes to different extents. And to, to, uh, for us, it is an important issue. And when we look at TTIP, uh, environmental issues are something on the mandate already recognized that should be an area that uh, no compromises need to be made. That we need to ensure that we maintain the proper environmental protection <coughs> standards. So I think the issue is well regarded and well recognized by everyone. And it's an issue that we'll touch upon. Uh, at the same time, uh, growth is, is a priority for the whole world, and I think we need to be able to strike a fine balance between, between both critical issues for, uh, for humanity. If, if I may just uh, tag on to that a little bit, it will be very interesting to watch uh, Europe exactly meet those challenges, as the minister said, about energy costs mm -hmm. as they increase. Uh, and I think certainly Europe um, and, and individual European countries have made decisions about uh, their renewable strategies and elsewhere, maintaining that balance. I think it will be a very important debate to watch within Europe itself and then how that it's global debate unfolds. Talking about renewables, I'm pleased to say that Greece is above our target in adoption of renewables okay. and we're going to be very we're going to be meeting the 2020 target with uh, with the current path of investments and that's i think it's, it's positive although i have to say that uh, the ad the adopt the fast adoption of renewable energy has positive consequence of course at the same time has a cost component which was not necessarily properly calculated at the beginning of this process yeah. I try to be a bit provocative too. I'm so glad. <laughs> so right there. Hi, my name is uh, Philip Finiello. I'm with the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, this question kind of extends to my, my previous position with the British Embassy, and I, I, I hate to bring up something somewhat non-EU related, but it is kind of related. You mentioned maritime being a priority. How much are you looking at, and how much would it benefit your maritime priority um, if the U.S. were to finally ratify UNCLOS and legitimize, you know that that global system, because I know there's issues in the South China Sea and and all over all over the world. How closely are you looking at that? How much would that benefit Greece's interest and its commercial priorities? Yeah. At the United Nations Convention uh, Law of the Sea Treaty, mm -hmm. um, the 1982 convention that we have yet to ratify. I can actually take it if you want. Yeah, I'm not an expert to the topic, <laughs> and I, I try not to be a jack of all trades. Uh, it's an issue I don't know well, so I'll I'll, I'll pass. I, I I follow actually unclosed issues because I we have an Arctic research project here. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll may I take please, it? Please. Um, I, I think this is. Um, an issue both of American leadership and also uh, seeking potentially the benefits, uh, whether that's the seabed uh, mining rights uh, or <coughs> extending our outer continental shelf. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a great missed opportunity, which I hope the Senate will, in its wisdom, seek to ratify on close as rapidly as possible. How's that? Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> we'll do this together, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> First and foremost, welcome to Washington, D.C. Pleasure to see you again. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Kanalopoulos. I'm with American University. My first question is with regards to TTIP. And to what extent could a successful negotiation of TTIP and the inherent revitalization of the transatlantic relationship, as well as the Greek presidency, how could Greece's geopolitical and strategic importance and role be increased and be positively impacted? That's my first question. And secondly, as Greece is trying to pave the path towards growth and recovery, don't you think that it's an imperative then that research and innovation are a part of the Ministry of Development rather than the Ministry of Education? And, don't you, and why hasn't the Greek government done anything to change this outdated institutional structure? Thank you. Excellent question, both of them. Uh, first of all, on uh, TTIP, it is a fundamental policy choice for Greece to increase it, the extroversy of its economy. For many years, we were a sort of 
I won't say a closed economy, but we were not export driven. And that created in 2009 not only a situation where our fiscal deficit was considerable, but also our current account had a considerable deficit, which actually has also gone to positive territory in 2013. The dual deficits of 2009 became the dual surpluses of 2013. So, and also it's a country that historically, and going back to ancient times, we were not, never concerned to compete. We wanted competition, we believed in the quality and the hard work of, uh, of our people, and open markets for us is something very positive. And I think one of the reasons Greece came to the crisis we came is that these fundamental Greek characteristics we forgot, we ignored in the last 10, 20 years. So opening global trade for us is a great opportunity. And that's where I think TTIP, together with the agreement with uh, Singapore, the agreement with Canada, opening markets, reducing barriers, is good for the Greek economy, which has seen for a number of years a positive growth in its exports. So that not, it's not the agreement, it will not increase our strategic position as an agreement itself, but it will facilitate global trade, which is in line with what as a government and as an economy we want to achieve. On the issue of R&D, uh, we can talk about institutions and sort of which ministry has which department, and I'm sure there's always an excellent argument for each and every um, formation. What I would say, though, is that going forward from 2014, we're doubling the R&D spend. And that, I think, is more important than versus who, ha who sort of signs the checks on sort of which label, which, which stationary prints the agreements. Uh, when we go to the next seven years of our EU cohesion budget, the 2014-2020 component, R&D will double. And also, I think one of the biggest competitive advantages of the Greek economy, which has not been discussed, is the quality of the workforce. We talk a lot about tourism, we talk a lot about the maritime industry, we talk about a lot about agriculture and the quality and value of Greek brands, which TTIP also hopefully will reinforce in the US. But we don't talk enough about a generation of very bright, well-educated people, many of them with sort of US degrees, European degrees, Greek degrees, in sciences, in technology. We've seen some startups picking up in Greece, and we've seen global players now investing in Greece. Samsung decided to do in Patra a research hub. Microsoft uh, was in Greece. The Google CEO was in Greece recently. The IBM chairman was in Greece very recently. We're seeing an inward trend of big global ICT players that are coming to Greece to invest in people. The Prime Minister was in Israel a couple of months ago, and I had the pleasure of being in that trip. And Israel has been very successful in creating in the Southeast Mediterranean an IST hub. We believe that Greece can also become a hub that, and take advantage of the quality of the people, their commitment, and their energy. And I think that's some, one of the key drivers for recovery going forward. And as I said, already the major players, Google, Microsoft, Samsung, IBM, uh, are recognizing that. Coca-Cola recently decided to open in Greece their pan-European social media center. That will open in Greece. It was an announcement last week. Procter & Gamble created an R&D center. Nokia Zeeman Network created an R&D center. And that only in the last 12 months. That means that there is an opportunity there. And that's why we're also coming there to double our investment into R&D to further facilitate this transformation of the Greek economy and the Greek society. Minister, can I just jump in here? And one of the real tragedies of the crisis, of many tragedies, was, was what we call brain drain, was the, the flight of very talented young people because the economic situation was so dire. This, this very encouraging news of ICTs and others coming back, are you seeing where flows are returning back, that young people, highly skilled people, are returning to Greece? I'm sorry to say not to the extent we would like, but there is a lot of people that actually left Greece, and that's natural when you have 60% unemployed. We had 60% now, we're down to 51. Both numbers are huge anyway, in, in, the, in the younger population. And you've seen the smarter people moving abroad, people that went to do a graduate degree abroad, not, not returning home after that. This has been clearly negative for society and the economy. But I see it as a huge opportunity, because you have what I would call idle capacity around the world. People that have worked for the major corporations, have worked for major startups in the US, in the UK, in, in a number of areas, have become more global in their approach, and these people uh, are eager to come back to Greece when opportunity arises. 
And that means that you can have a fast, you can see things turning fast and creating a multiplier effect because you have the skilled workforce, a lot of it in Greece, some of it abroad, and that works very complementary because global companies always appreciate to have in their mix of people, people that have worked abroad and have seen things working from the other side. So I think that's an opportunity rather than, it has been a short term risk, but it's a huge opportunity going forward. Fantastic. Yes, sir, over there, microphone coming. Uh, Vyacheslav Petrushka, Ambassador of the Republic of Moldova. Um, can you comment uh, on the possible convergence between TTIP negotiations and uh, DCFTA negotiations between EU and countries from Eastern Partnership? I mean, to what extent the, the DCFTA negotiations between EU and such countries as Moldova or Georgia could become part of the negotiation on TTIP? Thank you. First of all, I would say I'm very pleased to see you. We work very well with countries in the region and through the Black Sea Trade and Development Bank, which we, I'm a governor, we spent a lot of effort in, in creating this Eastern Partnership already. And, and this, this Black Sea Trade and Development Bank is based in Greece, based in Thessaloniki. And we are now further investing in our position in that bank to facilitate the integration in the Black Sea, uh, sea region. So as I said, for us, the Eastern Partnership is very important. And I think as we're going to a plurilateral trade model, although I have to say after Bali there's a bit more optimism on the multilateral level, I think both agreements can work very complementary. But they're not, we're not working together in the sense that one will delay the other or one will push the other. They're both very important initiatives for the Union, and we hope we'll see a positive outcome in both. Mr. I wanted to, on, on the previous question, wanted to mention, I think the one risk, and I'm a huge supporter of TTIP, the one risk that I think we face is that TTIP is it for the transatlantic relationship. This becomes the only source of our conversation, our drive. And we know, and the Minister will have first-hand experience of this, we're going to start the third round of negotiations next week. This is going to have tremendous up and downs uh, th through that. We are going to, if we want it to be ambitious, it's going to, as you said, compromise makes everyone feel that they haven't won. It's going to be extremely difficult. This cannot be the only thing. It is a strategic piece. It is not only to enhance our own economic benefit, but to create the international, the global standards. Uh, because let's, know, let's not make a mistake, there are competitive models for our value system of transparency and mm -hmm. openness and rules. So it is geostrategic, but I just, my fear and my caution as I watch the transatlantic relationship, uh, it can't be the only thing we're talking about. It's just a very critical part of it. I just want to add my unwelcome two cents into that conversation. Absolutely, you're right. And there's a number of institutions that we work together, the EU countries or the EU together with the US in issues of global security, for example. And NATO is probably the, one of the, the best example of that cooperation between the EU and the US. Uh, the issue with TTIP, it's uh, a tangible uh, instrument which if uh, both sides of the Atlantic work hard and make the right compromises, would in a short period of time uh, institutionalize the economic relationship. And that's why I think uh, we're seeing it as a priority. But of course, I'll, I'll take your point that there's many other ways. We are actively cooperating, and I think uh, we have an excellent relationship, one of the best relations we ever had. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I saw a question, yes, in the front here. Oh, sorry, the microphone is coming. Hold on, Marlon. Thank you. Welcome, Minister. My name is Vlasia Vasikeri. I'm represented, uh, I'm here to represent the ambassador of the European Union who is traveling and he's outside Washington. Um, uh, I would like to make two points. The first, uh, you refer to the elections of the parliament, <coughs> the change of the, co the changes of the commission. And so this requires a very strong council during your presidency and the next presidency. I would like to add that uh, in, all the, in these two changes, one third uh, very substantial institutional changes should be added than the entire uh, institution of external affairs, let's say the shop of Mrs. Ashton, the entire leadership will change there as well. So this will also require a stronger council for to ensure the continuity. 
Uh, the second thing I would like to mention, and uh, I'm sure your people have uh, informed you about this, is uh, how things have changed locally in Washington uh, with uh, respect to the coordination among the member states and the EU. Uh, we have uh, uh, weekly meetings on all the topics uh, where the people uh, of the embassies of the 28 who follow the regular topics come uh, and these topics go as far up as uh, the DCMs which meet once per a week and the heads of mission which meet who meet to once per month and this has created a very <coughs> strong coordination mechanism amongst the EU and the member states where everybody benefits for exchange of information for uh, additional information to promote the national agenda during the presidency and for uh, those embassies which lack specific information in technical areas, let's say uh, transport, uh, energy, uh, NSA issues, data protection, to benefit from the EU. Ma'am, do you have just a, can you have a quick yes. answer your question, so, please? Of course. I just, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, in the post-Lisbon area, the coordination of the member states and that of the EU has enhanced uh, dramatically and uh, there is a great multilateral process going on. I have to tell you from a Washington perspective, Europe is very confusing. Mm -hmm. Council, Commission, Parliament, Lisbon Treaty, reorientation of, of, of powers, commissioners, US director generals, and do we confuse you too? Executive, Senate, <laughs> House, <laughs> committees, majority leaders, minority leaders, they're also confusing for us. But the principles are very similar. Yes, indeed. Uh, people are represented through certain forms, the states are represented through certain forms, and there's the permanent executive that actually does the daily job. So in some sense, I think the EU and the US are very similar. Um, in their differences. <laughs> but the, just, just on the points mentioned, uh, first of all, yes, with the EAS, we have a good relationship. Uh, Baroness Aston will be presiding on the Foreign Affairs Council when it talks about political issues. I will be pre presiding the Foreign Affairs Council when it talks about economic issues on the first six, half, uh, six months of 2014. And I think they have played a good role in coordinating European voice. Um, on the issue of the EU transition, one thing I didn't mention in my opening remarks, as I promised to keep them short, <laughs> is that uh, Prime Minister Samaras being proactive uh, met with uh, Italian Prime Minister Letta uh, well before the beginning of the presidency and we, we agreed with the Italians which would be the, president, the, would be the presiding country in the second semester of 2014 to coordinate more than normal among ourselves through 2014. And with the Italian uh, Deputy Minister of the Economy, uh, I'm already working very uh, regularly together and we're discussing issues of the Greek presidency, preparing the Italian presidency, so the council have an extra level of stability in this transitional year for the other European institutions. Fantastic. Yes, we have a question way in the back. Good morning. My name is Katrina Soku with Greek Daily, Kathy Marini. Uh, thank you, Minister, for this talk. And uh, could you please uh, update us on the structural reforms, like a short update, on the structural reforms uh, taking place in Greece right now and what's their state, given that uh, the Troika and the IMF are focusing quite a lot on the structural reforms going forward? And d d d did you, do you see like a, a delay in uh, their dividends being uh, uh, benefiting the economy, and when do you expect them to really uh, benefit the economy? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Structural reforms for us is the, is the most critical priority uh, for 2014. As I mentioned before, I think that has not been well reported around the world. Greece has been already ranked top in the world by OECD in the adoption of structural reforms already and the fact that Greece has already moved 28 places in the World Bank means we've done much more than people give us credit for. And uh, I'm not using my interpretation of progress, I'm using forms like the World Bank and OECD, as, um, which, believe me, they're very tough in their, um, in their um, 
calculations. We moved already um, very aggressively with the pension reform, the labor reform. Uh, we're moving ahead with privatizations. We already seen that one of the key privatizations closed last week. Uh, we closed also the gas network, although I understand the EU has raised certain issues which create complexity for deep privatization to complete. So in a lot of the areas, we, we're moving very fast. We've liberalized uh, trades, we liberalized markets. There's still things to do. And um, I think the task force for Europe has recently said that we're doing pretty well in uh, these structural reforms. Uh, we've seen the public sector contracting substantially in the last three years, if you look at total employment in the public sector. Uh, and there is further steps that we're taking. One of the most important steps for the public sector for me is the program we have now to upgrade the quality of the public sector by replacing 15,000 people with more skilled um, people that we really need. In many areas of government we are under-resourced, in some areas we are over-resourced, and I think this movement of 25,000 people between departments that need people to departments that have excess people will play a role. So I think there is a lot of progress. I think it's not well reported around the world based on the assessments of these independent uh, entities I mentioned. But clearly, we have a lot. Of, there's always more things to do. But I have to say, in certain structural reforms, I think we've gone faster and deeper than many other EU countries will dare to do in areas which are important, like pension reform, for example. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. Minister, pleasure to have you here in Washington. Uh, John Sidalides with Trilogy Advisors. Uh, you've already mentioned several different areas of strategic development in the Greek economy. Uh, you spoke about fossil fuel extraction, natural gas, and my understanding is potentially significant reserves of petroleum, if we can get the equipment down several geological layers, and also the software development sector that you alluded to with technology and R&D interest for major companies in the U.S. And, and elsewhere in the world. I wanted to ask also about an analogy between the U.S. And, and Europe in terms of the baby boomer population and millions of Americans who've migrated from colder climates in the United States to retire in Florida and the Southwest. Is there potentially an equivalent vision for Greece to become the Florida of the European Union and to develop a retirement-based economy that has been tremendously prosperous for a number of states here in the U.S. relative to other parts of the economy? It seems that Greece offers a lifestyle, a climate, and potentially so many other advantages for that type of a growing sector demographically that no other part of Europe can offer. That's what we would call a Greek snowbird. <laughs> I think there is potential, and Greece moved um, uh, forward in 2013 uh, in April by liberalizing residency laws. Mm -hmm. And that was a very critical component for a strategy to attract people to come and spend a considerable part of their year, if not all, in Greece. And now Greece gives an automatic residence permit for people acquiring property above a threshold of uh, just south of $300,000. Mm -hmm. um, Greece is an entry point to Europe from the east first of all. And I think this is a theme that plays well in the area of logistics, first of all. That was something you didn't mention when you sort of brought all the critical sectors together. We've seen companies seeing Greece as their entry point to the EU for their logistics uh, infrastructure. I think the same can play very well for people from the region that want a second home within the EU. And this, after the liberalization of resident permit laws, is playing well. So I think there is the potential there. We have, we, have a very we're very we have a very friendly environment, a Western economy, Western democratic values, and uh, the appropriate legal framework now to facilitate people coming in. We've seen a lot of interest from developers to develop the appropriate infrastructure because people coming in normally don't want one flat in the middle of a city. They want something which is more... Um, uh, more complete, a sort of a retirement village with the appropriate facilities and the appropriate medical facilities. And we've seen a lot of histories from developments coming through to build these kind of things. So I think, yes, that's a theme that can play and I already attracts uh, the initial investors. On a cold day, I'll like, close my eyes and think of Crete and I'm good. Yes, ma'am. Buy a house. Well, <laughs> loan me $300,000. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. Hello. Good morning. My name is Sofia. I am here representing the DCM from the Embassy of Portugal. And I need to tell you that the timing of your visit actually was a bit misfortune for us because we had your Portuguese counterpart here two days ago and really we would like very much to put you in contact with him. Bruno. Um, Yes, Pedro and also and also Antonio, uh, mm -hmm. the Minister of Economy. So that is a... Uh, we were together in Indonesia. Oh, okay. So that's <laughs> taken came, care of. And he came to Athens a month ago. Okay. Okay, perfect. That's taken care of already. So um, I would like to, to address you with two questions. One uh, regarding the structural reforms, because Greece as well as Portugal uh, needs to underperform a very um, big uh, challenge on structural reforms. Portugal has concluded 80% uh, of the structural reforms calendar. On re what regards Greece, what I would like to ask you is how do you envisage your privatizations calendar? I am, I am asking you this because we had a very successful IPO to our postal services a week ago and we are now moving forward with a privatization of the transportation sector mm -hmm. and the water sector and some others those being the most important. So that is the first question. The second question is um, now focusing on your priorities for the EU Council. First, um, congratulate you for having banking union as a top priority because we do believe that that is a very important instrument to reduce the financial fragmentation that affects uh, several countries within the EU, most of all the, so the southern countries like Portugal and Greece. And what I would like to ask you in that regard is uh, how do you anticipate the um, difficulties that we all know are going to be addressed in what regards the SRM, the, the single resolution mechanism that, as you know, last week determined uh, uh, um, another meeting followed the, this last ECOFIN. So that is uh, the question. How do you anticipate uh, the, the troubles that we need to face at that level and how do you think we, you can try to, to work it out? Thank you. Um. First of all, on the issue of privatization, uh, Samara's government has increased rather than decreased the scope of privatizations, uh, bringing in additional assets that we think will benefit from private ownership. And I think a key example of that is the railway system, which was not in the original uh, privatization program. Um, we think that there is a lot of benefit to the economy from privatization. Not, it's not the inflow of funds that makes the difference. It's the incremental investments to upgrade assets that normally comes together with, uh, with a new capital ownership. We hope, for example, that uh, one of the key hotels we just privatized will bring incremental investments, and we understand that this is the plan from the preferred bidders. We're progressing, hopefully, in the next few weeks uh, with a privatization that we're trying for many years to do, which is the old airport of Athens, and that could be a major catalyst for redevelopment in Athens. Uh, there's, there's difficulties many times, to be fair. Privatizations are not easy. And at the one thing we're trying, there's a lot of, I won't say, um, there's a lot of priorities which not always tie well together. One priority is, of course, transparency and fairness of price. So we need to get in the best price. The second, at the same time, you need to comply with very complicated EU regulations. I mentioned before as an example that we, we have a preferred beta for the Greek gas network company. But now it has to go. There's a there's an EU component that is uh, may take more time than even the EU anticipated at the beginning, or it took a long time for the EU to approve the railway privatizations because there's always legacy issues that need to be cleared with DigiComp. So it's not the easiest environment to work with. Uh, but up to now, I think there is a flow of privatizations, and I think this flow of privatization will continue in 2014. Uh, with regard to the banking union, CRMs, it's not an easy topic and. We need to find a mechanism to protect uh, European taxpayers from the banking crisis of the past, but at the same time create the mechanism that the banks have stability themselves within the deposit base. There's a lot of challenges that need to uh, be accommodated. Uh, I don't want us presidency to come into the topic. You know, presidencies should not come very, be very specific on issues discussed within uh, council under EU tradition, but I think that ECOFIN will put it as a priority and we hopefully will see a resolution uh, before the change of the commission.
Well, and I think just on the uh, two finger on the banking union, I think what makes this anxiety increase is knowing that the ECB is about to conduct, we hope, very stressful stress tests. And it may, without that SRM and backstopping, it may cause some market concern about, uh, about the Stre health and safety of the largest Stress tests are important. Markets. One thing that also needs to be take, uh, considered a bit uh, more broadly is capital requirements at, diff at different stages of the cycle. Uh, the cross-cycle approach we're having is being sort of uh, challenged by, na by many thinkers in the banking sector, thinking that the economies need to over-protect uh, at times of, times of economic growth and uh, be more tolerant when already the pressure of an economic downturn has been experienced within the banking books. So one of the issues, for example, now being discussed in Greece as part of the stress test is does Greece still need to have an above-market uh, capital requirement where already sort of the our sovereign uh, debt has been restructured and the Greek economy has stabilized. Absolutely wonderful. I saw a few more hands up. Yes, please. I'm trying to give short answers to get the, the most uh, question. You're doing great. Thank you. Uh, Wolf Brookman uh, with the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany here in Washington. Uh, Mr. Minister, I wonder if you could uh, address a little further the, the the, the topic of uh, the connection between TTIP and the European Parliament. Uh, we know the European Parliament uh, is increasingly important. Uh, and uh, of course now we have elections coming up uh, next year. Uh, maybe two questions. First, to what extent will TTIP even come up in the context of European Parliament elections? As you probably know, in our elections, uh, TTIP would probably not even uh, come up in most in most cases uh, and secondly uh, with respect to comparing the institutional uh, US and European institutional framework uh, what exactly will the role of the Parliament be in and in, in the final agreement as it, uh, it, it is brought to the Council uh, first of all I would not say the Parliament is becoming increasingly important I would say the Parliament is very important uh, has been, will be, and will remain very important. On Wednesday morning, I'm hosting in Athens the uh, International Trade Committee of the European Parliament, which are coming to see us uh, to discuss issues uh, that the Greek presidency will be facing in the first semester. And on the 23rd of January, if I don't get the day wrong, I will be in Brussels uh, presenting the presidency priorities to Parliament and being uh, and un answer all the questions I will expect will be a very lengthy session. Um, we're taking issues from raised by Parliament very seriously from the beginning. Parliament and Council will, just to make it a bit clear what's, how does it work, the Council, which is the Member States, give authority to the Commission, which is the executive arm, to negotiate. So the regular negotiation is done between the US Trade Representative, and his team, and the European Commission, Commissioner Karel de Gucht, and his team. Now, when they, and they report to Council very regularly. The next report to Council will be on the 28th of February in Athens, where we're going to have uh, as a key topic of discussion to, to take the state of play. And also, the Greek presidency will be inviting senior business leaders, and that's an unusual thing for Council, to attend Council and present both, from both sides of the Atlantic both from the US and EU, and present to the council ministers what are the key issues that the market has versus uh, TTIP. I understand a similar session with around 300 stakeholders took place during the previous round of negotiations at the chief negotiator level. So as a chamber of commerce, you should know that we're taking very seriously not only parliament, but also the stakeholders, the chambers, the workers, the labor unions, the professional unions, and make sure that TTIP meets the market needs. Uh, so that's something we're going to do. On the election topic, I don't know if it's going to become an election topic. Uh, there's broad consensus that TTIP is important, and that was uh, obvious in Council in Luxembourg when we needed 28 out of 28 states to give the mandate to the Commission. We required unanimity, and unanimity was achieved. And from, we'll see also how the Trade Committee, the, the INTA, the Trade uh, Committee of Parliament, has not raised issues against the agreement. Obviously, when we call about TTIP, different people expect different things. So towards the end of the negotiation, where specific chapters will, will come up in public, I'm sure there will be 
topics for discussion. But clearly, as I said in my opening remarks, a trade agreement is an outcome of compromise. So not everyone will be happy with each and every line of the, of the agreement. Right. Let's see, any more hands? One hand in the back, sir. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Um, first of all, I think my name is Pietro Masci, I'm an economist. Um, first of all, I think that uh, Greece, the Greek government, and the Greek people should be congratulated for all uh, the achievement. I just uh, think about that uh, three, four, five years ago, many, if not all, commentators and, uh, and uh, experts were saying uh, not uh, if uh, Greece uh, remain in the euro, but when we leave the, the euro, and when Greece implode. So I think you should be very proud uh, of uh, all the effort, uh, reform, uh, structural reform that uh, you have made. Uh, and. Uh, and this is not the case uh, in uh, other countries, uh, as uh, you mentioned, that are in a similar uh, situation. There are various questions that I, I would ask, the, um, of the diaspora, the other one of the foreign direct investment, uh, the skilled and unskilled uh, labor. But one uh, thing that uh, I would like to, 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 to see your opinion is uh, how do you reconcile your uh, pro-market uh, attitude, uh, view, and structural reforms with uh, a rather pro-government uh, approach that cool. many pro-government approach that many uh, governments in uh, Europe uh, take, uh, including the overall uh, European uh, Union with the central role of the, of the government, intervention, uh, public spending, taxation, and so on. Thank you. Uh, a topic you didn't raise, but I just wanted to raise, having the opportunity being in CSIS. It's about the euro. And I think it's more valuable to make this comment now than if I have made it three years ago. The euro is not uh, a temporary mechanism. It's not an instrument sort of that countries have decided to use for a period and then move on. As you're moving towards a stronger economical and political integration between the European Union countries, and this is a said priority for all of us in the Union, the euro has to be seen as an irrevocable arrangement. I don't think anyone suggested last month that Detroit should leave the dollar or California should leave the dollar. And if anyone suggested that the US, people would look at him with great surprise. Sort of, that's, you can't do that. That doesn't happen. And uh, because the euro is a younger currency, maybe the markets have underappreciated the length that the EU went to protect the single currency. If, this, if sort of at the end of the crisis in two, three years, we, re, we do one pager with key lesson learned, I think the number one key lesson learned, and a lot of market participants uh, underappreciated and being from the market, I would say they bet on the wrong, uh, on the wrong outcome, they underappreciated the political resolve that the EU, the ECB, all the countries had to ensure at any cost that the single currency stands. And when Draghi said, was it a year ago, that I'll do whatever it takes, they, we did whatever it takes. So people betting on the wrong side of the euro, up to now, and I think they will in the future, are betting on the wrong outcome. Um, on the issue of reconciliation, uh, I think the, the Greek government is being driven by a pro-market approach. We say investments is the key thing for the economy. And, uh, you know, politics is about choices. And our choice is we need to have uh, a less regulated environment, a private sector driven environment, an environment that hails entrepreneurship because not is the right thing, because it's the only way to reduce unemployment and return Greek to prosperity. So it's, it's a conscious choice we're making and we're serving our choice in each and every policy junction we come through. Fantastic. Hi, I'm not sure we have no more hands. You've exhausted them. You have handled every question. And my goodness, did you get a lot thrown at you? I have to say my one comment. I, as I've looked at the euro crisis for four plus years, I believe the economists and the market underestimated the politics and the power of the political solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I fear European politicians underestimated the economics of a very divergent union. And both 
underestimated each other's force, I guess is the most polite way I could say. But the fact that Greece, as, as you and, and others have suggested, has overcome enormous challenge. Um, and you have inspired me. I see a much brighter future and information that I wasn't aware of. So thank you for your powerful presentation. I hope we are on your itinerary the second time you visit Washington and you can give us an update on TTIP, the banking union, how Greece is undertaking its structural reform. We're so grateful that you were here with us. Best of luck in a presidency. You're going to be a very busy man for the next six months, so we wish you well. We wish the government great success, and you have a very big fan base here in Washington. So thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.